ville man gick sig till storan nå. Hej fagraste Lindel, hur vi alla. Där han ville gullhare på slå. För de runerna, de lister han och vinner. Ladies and germs, it's time once again for us to take a trip to Norge. Yes, it's been! Voran Harida. Third wave, second rate Norwegian black metal bands. The final edition. I think this is the last episode that I'm going to shoot of this brilliant, uncompromising, opinionated series. I think I've run the gamut of all the bands that I want to talk about that are from Norway, that aren't your top tiers. It seems like I have to explain this in every video and I wish I didn't, but I'll do it again. Not the best, not the upper echelon of the Norwegian black metal bands. You all know that. I'm talking about the underground. So while we're uh, traversing the fjords, um, we're gonna be listening to a little known band called Mangled. Gotta turn it up a little bit. From Norway. I don't think you would ever guess these guys were from Norway, just listening to them. Um, but they're really underrated and pretty unique, especially this record. Um, Parish is what it's called. And uh, Wild Rags put this out back in the day. Uh, I am going to put this 94. Yeah, so kind of late in the era for Norwegian death metal. But um, it also kind of has some trappings, I think, of... Borknagar, in a way, it was kind of like big, riffy, kind of slidey sort of riffs. Um, it's really interesting. Sometimes it gets kind of generic. It also, like, I think one of the things I think that's most charming about it is how it kind of steps over itself, steps over its own feet, or trips over its own feet, trying to do one thing and then do another thing. Uh, and it does them kind of pretty good, but sometimes they just don't really mesh very well. There's really good parts, and there's some parts that are like, eh, I would have thrown that out, you know? Um, and I don't really know anything else about their discography. Um, I gave a quick listen to the record that came out after this recently and thought it wasn't quite as good as this, but I put this on every now and then and I really like it. So let's get into a couple of Norwegian bands. Um, I don't have all of this band's discography and I'm not all that well versed on their discography, but there was a debut called Tarnet by this band, Malignant Eternal. Um, Tarnet is a real sought after rarity. I think it came out on uh, Hot Records, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't think you can get a copy of it for less than like $250 or so. Um, so download it or reissue it, what have you. It's pretty good. Um, sounds totally fucking Norwegian. It's synthy. Um, it sounds really fucking vampiric, and it really falls in line with some of this stuff, and also some of the early Demi Borger kind of stuff, um, and Satyricon in a little bit of ways. Uh, this one, though, is the, the follow-up to that one, Far Beneath the Sun. Uh, it's nowhere near as great as Tarnet, for sure, but it is pretty good. I, I'm going to say that it's worth owning, at least. Uh, it came out on Napalm. This is kind of one of the later era Napalm records where they were kind of moving toward the end of the century and stylistically a lot of those bands were getting to the more technological, kind of industrial, sort of modern sounds, I guess. Um, and a lot of that stuff gets kind of wishy-washy. And so I think um, the packaging on this could really turn you away and think, make you think that it's um, worse than it really is. Um, it's, a, it's got a lot of like throwback kind of speed metal kind of riffs to it. Uh, mixed in with that more Norwegian kind of keyboardy sort of sound. It's an interesting kind of amalgamation um, that a Malignant Eternal pulls off pretty well. But whoever designed this was really trying to sell this to a, a more new school, forward thinking kind of crowd, I think. Um, and they really missed the mark on representing what the style of the album actually is. Um, and that might have been the art direction from Napalm, trying to get them to fit in with the Beyond Dawns and uh, Thorns, what have you, at the, of the time. But uh, I think this came out in, uh, yeah, nothing here. Uh, maybe 98, 99. Um, and I don't think they did anything else after Far Beneath the Sun. And if they did, it's probably terrible because I don't, it's not on my radar. So we've got these guys, I've talked about these guys a few times. Um, 
since we've gone through them alphabetically, and I actually got this one in uh, kind of recently. This is Dismal Euphony. Uh, this is the debut. They did an EP, uh, self-titled I want to say, and those songs are re-recorded for this album, Soria Maria Slot. <coughs> um, I would say I think that debut EP is kind of worth getting because the biggest caveat to the enjoyment and maybe the success of this album is the production of it. Uh, the keyboard player was fucking cranking it all the way up in the studio. The, this guy could not get enough volume out of uh, the producer. But this is some really good stuff. It's kind of drenched in reverb. It's kind of vampiric. It's really, really, really gothic. It's got female vocals all over the place. So, I mean, if you're, if you're wanting something that's fucking aggressive and brutal, stay the fuck away from this. I mean, everything you need to know <laughs> is contained in this goddamn booklet. These guys look so fucking lame. Yeah, um, but uh, it's good stuff. It's, it's kind of emperor-ish. Um, kind of Demi Borger-ish, uh, but it's got it's got some character to it. Um, and then they followed it up with a record I really like, Autumn Leaves, The Rebellion of Tides. This also came out on Napalm Records, and I think this is the stronger album of the two. Uh, and this is where it ends with Dismal Euphony. Um, I think they did either an EP or an album called Python Zero after this, and I'm not sure when the timeline, but the lady singer and keyboard player died and they just took it into fucking just a horrible stylistic change that was a complete suicide for the band but this is really good um i think they stay with the kind of slow more downtrodden kind of um pace to it and it kind of almost incidentally has some stylistic doom metal feelings to it uh it's a really interesting kind of album autumn leaves the rebellion of time One of my favorites. Let's get into Aura Noir. I it's fucking so sad about. I think I lost the no, not Dreams Like Desert. The third one, the green album cover. I had it not too long ago. Anyway, we'll get into it. Dreams Like Desert is where it all starts. This came out on Hot Records. The debut EP. It's kind of a long EP, but it's really good. Um, you know, it's just killer stuff. It's a little bit more amateurish than the debut Black Thrash Attack, which I think is one of the greatest thrash metal records ever recorded. I like this more than your Sodoms and your Creators and Destructions. Not seeing anything wrong with those bands, but when I think of thrash, this was my introduction to thrash back in 97 when this came out. Um, and so this is my template for what that kind of music is like. Uh, and there's just so much fucking decadent treats on here to enjoy. The fucking drumming on the songs that Carl Michael plays on is so great. The songs are super catchy. You can play air drums along with all of them. Um, this is kind of a weird record because Apollyon and Carl Michael switch between um, bass and vocals and drums while Blasphemer just plays guitar. Um, and I think that all the songs were written by Apollyon and Carl Michael and Blasphemer is just really throughout the discography has been um, just kind of a hired guitar player uh, for live shows and kind of on the albums or whatnot. Um, but this fucking record cannot be oversold. It's so good. Malicious Records, 97. Um, yeah, Black Thrash Attack. And that one. And then, what the, I can't think of what the third album is called, um, or the second album actually, but somehow I lost it got a green cover on it and it is so good <laughs> so good I can't even remember it um, I got a lot going on tonight so I'm kind of like hurried brained um, but it is a killer record but that's for me is kind of where R Noir that's where I kind of split paths but I've been trying to make amends with the band uh, these last few years and we'll get into that but this is increased damnation and this is a reissue of the Dreams Like Deserts EP with a uh, couple of extras previously unreleased and live and studio material. So, you know the drill, kind of one of those things. Um, so if you can't find Dreams Like Deserts, you'll probably wind up paying 35 40 bucks for this thing original. So just get this. Um, 
I just realized I'm forgetting a band. Um, and then we've got uh, Live on Elm Street in 96. Great show, right in their prime, exactly right in their prime. Stuff from their first two albums, Wretched Face of Evil, Mirage, The Pest, Fighting for Hell. Man, yeah, uh, their early stuff is so good. So then they got kind of weird, and I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with being weird, and I love when Carl Michael gets weird, but for me, having loved the early template for what Oranoir was, to, to go away from that and turn that into a weird, more like King Crimson kind of <clears throat> Voivod-ish stylistic direction is... It just it kind of breaks my brain a little bit to try and go there, but I respect it for what it is. Let's I, I think I can say that much. So then we've got um, is it the Merciless? I think came out next. Um, this came out on Tyrant Syndicate, and since I kind of ignored these albums when they came out, um, I didn't want to dislike them, so I didn't really spend that much time listening to them, and I didn't get them until recently. But uh, yeah, this is a little bit more weird. <clears throat> and then we got Hades Rise. This is way more weird. I think this is really where they finally like kicked the old or noir style off the cliff and decided just to be total fucking weirdo maniacs. Um, and so also another thing about these is that these albums don't have Carl Michael playing drums on them anymore. And Carl Michael is maybe my favorite drummer of all time, metal drummer of all time. Uh, he, his styles, his licks, his fucking fills, his everything were just so good. Uh, and I miss his playing so fucking much. Um, so that was another reason why like, I had to split paths with Or and Or. Um, so Apollyon does the drums on um, Out to Die. But I think, uh, is it Dirge Rep plays on maybe both of these? Um, I'm not going to pretend like I know because I'm not certain. Um, but so Apollyon takes over on this one, and then they have a new album called Aura Noire or something like that, which is fucking even more weird than these other ones. Um, and it's it's really cool. You can hear a lot of kind of virus kind of stuff going on there if you're a follower of the Carl Michael uh, stuff. So that's Aura Noir. Check out Black Thrash Attack, man. It's so fucking great. Dangerous to you guys. This is Thorns. Uh, and I'm showing this one because this is my copy that has the first two Thorns demos on it. Um, is it Grimirk and Thrunderton? Yeah. So those were just like riff tapes. Um, they had like one song, Airy Descent, I think, that uh, had drums on it. And Emperor actually covers one of those songs on here, so that's kind of cool. But when I think of Thorns, I don't really think of their demo material. However, in interviews with a lot of Norwegian bands, they will say that those... Uh, riff tapes and rehearsal tapes or whatnot had a lot of influence on um, what was going on around 92 to 94 somewhat there um, so but like I just don't think of thorns when I think of thorns I think of this um, and I wouldn't say like this has a lot to do with having come from Norway uh, but this is just a fantastic fucking release uh, it's got Aldron on vocals, switching off with Satir on vocals. And I don't ordinarily think of Satir as being an incredible vocalist or anything, but I think I like his vocals um, paired with this music more than I do with Satyricon. I'm not a big Satyricon fan. I think he's kind of a pompous fuck uh, in a lot of ways. And so I think that the music of Satyricon kind of, kind of sounds like that sentiment to me, but this is really fucking awesome. Forward thinking is all hell. It's super weird, and I like. I, don't, I also ordinarily don't like Hellhammer's drumming, but I think he does a pretty good job of just kind of scaling it back and just serving the music exactly the way it needs to be. It's a super fun, experimental, kind of weird release. Next we've got a little Comfar. Um, I don't know a whole lot about Comfar because after, I think there's a another album maybe after this one or whatnot um, that I need to get I think I've yeah it's like got a gray Viking kind of cover on it um, I can't remember I think malicious put that one out so which one came out first anyways this is an EP comes on a little MCD this is three tracks um, one of the very first yeah this is seasons of mist 003 so this is when seasons of mist got their beginning and uh, 
I think this sounds a lot like Satyricon's uh, Dark Medieval Times. Just drenched in reverb. Sounds like the guitars and the vocals and the drums are just like echoing across the vast ocean at night. Maybe thundering down from the fjords or whatnot. But it is very early Viking metal. Um, super good riffing. Um, I, this is a solo project at this point. See, Comfort has is still active to this day. And I haven't cared about any of their new releases for a really long time. And I don't think it's any... It has anything to do with them putting out some poopy material. I just, I don't know. I just figured at some point there's no way he could still be putting out good records. But I could be wrong for that matter. Um, I just am trying to figure out if this was a solo project at this point or not. I kind of think it's that way in my head, but my head's got a lot of wrong stuff in it. Dolk. Yeah, I want to say this is a solo project. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Um, but good stuff. If you like Satyricon's uh, early work, this is totally in line with that kind of stuff. And um, if you're only familiar with Comfar's like post 2000 material, definitely go back and listen to this stuff. It just sounds more approachable, more realistic and more human uh, and less digital than a lot of their uh, the albums I think that came out <laughs> after that time period. Uh, we've got Covenant with a C, not with a K. Uh, if you got Covenant with a K, Fuck it, it's not worth listening to. This is really the only covenant that you need. Uh, and these are actually the same album. This was the debut in the Times Before the Light. Mord Grimm Records put this out. Um, 95? Um, so this is one of the guys from, well, one of these guys was in Demi Borger up until 99. Uh, and there's a lot of crossover stylistic influence from Demi Borger and Troll, which is another project that he was in and still is in um, but this debut is really fantastic it's really kind of uh, orchestral and symphonic without being too too anything it's just a really nice well-balanced Norwegian black metal record and then they got kind of weird um, so this reissue they changed the name with the, to having a K um, and uh, Hellhammer came into play on them and uh, they did this record called Nexus Polaris, which I'm not really a fan of, um, even though Spared, who I like the writing of in Arcturus, wrote that material. But uh, it just it just never really clicked with me. And then we've got a band that I forgot to grab the stuff of. So not too long ago, I covered these guys in my alphabetical videos. So by all means, instead of wishing that I had elaborated more in this video about Dotheim's Guard, go back to my Dotheim's Guard video and uh, I wax poetic about those guys entirely for too long because this is one of my favorite groups. I'll put a link down below so you can get there real quickly, but quick rundown, Krona Tokonga is the debut and this at a first glance sounds like a pretty typical Transylvanian Hunger kind of uh, Norwegian black metal record, but it really deserves your total attention because it's an amazing amazing release um it like it's just all the aesthetics that sound kind of typical about it the songwriting and the riff styles uh going on in this are just just phenomenal avant-garde kind of playing um uh, and then like i've never i'm hardly ever impressed by bass playing but fenris from dark throne plays bass on this and his bass playing adds such an incredible element to the melodicism going on in the atmosphere on this record it's it's really an incredible album um, and Aldron's vocals are fucking awesome. So then they followed that up with Monumental Possession, which is um, kind of playing a little bit more thrash metal, speed metal kind of stuff, um, but not too far of a cry from Krona Tokonga. It's really good. It kind of gets buried underneath a lot of the other albums that are coming around, coming out around that time. Um, but it's a really killer uh, album. And then we got this EP, Satanic Art, and this is really where a lot of people, I think gave up on Dotham's Guard, but I think this is really where Dotham's Guard found their footing uh, and hit their stride. Um, this stuff is super weird and kind of uh, turn of the century, technological, kind of industrial, um, piano-driven kind of stuff. Uh, Galder from Old Man's Child joins them for a quick minute, and I think he has a, a nice dimension there. And then comes 666 International, which is was at the time the wildest, most forward-thinking thing to come out of Norway and maybe ever maybe ever I would say it is so fucking drugged out bonkers nuts 
Um, I love it to death. It's just such a monument of breaking ground, fucking the boundaries, and saying we're doing our own thing. Um, it's just so fucking good. I highly recommend. Even if you think you don't like this record, listen to it for me. Give it another shot because it's a fucking brilliant, brilliant record. Super Valent Outcast. This album to me sounds like fulfilling a record contract. Uh, it's way too aggressive. It doesn't have um, Aldrin on vocals. I don't like the vocalist on here. Um, in fact, this two CD version has a demo version of the album, uh, I think with some more tracks tacked on that didn't make the cut to the album. Um, and it is my preferred version of Super Villain, Super Villain Outcast. So lastly, we've got Umbra Omega, 2015, my number one album of that year. Uh, and Aldrin is back on vocals, and I think everything is back in place. Um, but it is still stylistically just fucking wild. It's so forward-thinking and fun to listen to. It's just an absolute head trip to listen to. I don't really think the cover art really reflects how insane and weird the album is, but what are you going to do? Um, so, unless I think of anything else, um, I might do maybe like an honorable mentions or something and whatnot, um, but I think the next logical thing to do is to do a third wave, second rate Swedish black metal bands. Not that that's really even a thing, and I kind of feel like I'm stepping more out of my comfort zone with Sweden, but I think I can pull off at least a couple of videos um, worth your time and worth uh, shooting. So we're going to probably do that next. Um, so let me know where you think I ought to go after Sweden. Obviously, I think Finland kind of makes sense, but I don't know, Germany, Canada, US, I don't know. Let me know what you think, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.